This is the only way to get beyond this veil of Maya, to realize what truth is. And the Upanishads indicate what is meant by realizing the truth. It means recognizing neither good nor bad, but knowing all as coming from the Self. Self is in everything. It means denying the universe, shutting your eyes to it, seeing the Lord in hell as well as in heaven, seeing the Lord in death as well as in life. This is the line of thought in the passage I have read to you. The earth is a symbol of the Lord, the sky is the Lord, the place we fill is the Lord, everything is Brahman. And this is to be seen, realized, not simply talked or thought about. We can see as its logical consequence that when the soul has realized that everything is full of the Lord, of Brahman, it will not care whether it goes to heaven or hell or anywhere else, whether it be born again on this earth or in heaven. These things have ceased to have any meaning to that soul because every place is the same. Every place is the temple of the Lord. Every place has become holy and the presence of the Lord is all that it sees in heaven or hell or anywhere else. Neither good nor bad, neither life nor death, only the one infinite Brahman exists. According to the Vedanta, when a man has arrived at that perception, he has become free and he is the only man who is fit to live in this world, others are not. The man who sees evil, how can he live in this world? His life is a mass of misery. The man who sees dangers, his life is a misery. The man who sees death, his life is a misery. That man alone can live in this world. He alone can say, I enjoy this life and I am happy in this life. Who has seen the truth and the truth in everything? By the by, I may tell you that the idea of hell does not occur in the Vedas anywhere. It comes with the Puranas much later. The worst punishment according to the Vedas is coming back to earth, having another chance in this world. From the very first, we see the idea as taking the impersonal turn. The ideas of punishment and reward are very material and they are only consonant with the idea of a human God who loves one and hates another just as we do. Punishment and reward are only admissible with the existence of such a God. They had such a God in the Samhita and there we find the idea of fear entering but as soon as we come to the Upanishads, the idea of fear vanishes and the impersonal idea takes its place. It is naturally the hardest thing for man to understand this impersonal idea, for he is always clinging on to the person. Even people who are thought to be great thinkers get disgusted at the idea of the impersonal God. But to me, it seems so absurd to think of God as an embodied man. Which is the higher idea, a living God or a dead God? A God whom nobody sees, nobody knows, or a God known? The impersonal God is a living God, a principle. The difference between personal and impersonal is this, that the personal is only a man and the impersonal idea is that he is the angel, the man, the animal and yet something more which we cannot see because impersonality includes all personalities is the sum total of everything in the universe and infinitely more besides. As the one fire coming into the world is manifesting itself in so many forms and yet is infinitely more besides, so is the impersonal. We want to worship a living God. I have seen nothing but God all my life, nor have you. To see this chair, you first see God and then the chair in and through Him. He is everywhere saying, I am. The moment you feel I am, you are conscious of existence. Where shall we go to find God if we cannot see Him in our own hearts and in every living being? Thou art the man, thou art the woman, thou art the girl and thou art the boy. Thou art the old man tottering with a stick. Thou art the young man walking in the pride of his strength. Thou art all that exists. 
a wonderful living God who is the only fact in the universe. This seems to many to be a terrible contradiction to the traditional God who lives behind a veil somewhere and whom nobody ever sees. The priests only give us an assurance that if we follow them, listen to their admonitions and walk in the way they mark out for us, then when we die, they will give us a passport to enable us to see the face of God. What are all these heaven ideas but simply modifications of this nonsensical priest craft? Of course, the impersonal idea is very destructive. It takes away all trade from the priests, churches and temples. In India, there is a famine now, but there are temples in each one of which there are jewels worth a king's ransom. If the priest taught this impersonal idea to the people, their occupation would be gone. Yet, we have to teach it unselfishly without priestcraft. You are God and so am I. Who obeys whom? Who worships whom? You are the highest temple of God. I would rather worship you than any temple, image or Bible. Why are some people so contradictory in their thought? They like fish slipping through our fingers. They say they are hard-headed practical men. Very good. But what is more practical than worshipping here, worshipping you? I see you, feel you and I know you are God. The Muhammadan says, there is no God but Allah. The Vedanta says, there is nothing that is not God. It may frighten many of you, but you will understand it by degrees. The living God is within you and yet you are building churches and temples and believing all sorts of imaginary nonsense. The only God to worship is the human soul in the human body. Of course, all animals are temples too, but man is the highest, the Taj Mahal of temples. If I cannot worship in that, no other temple will be of any advantage. The moment I have realized God sitting in the temple of every human body, the moment I stand in reverence before every human being and see God in him, that moment I am free from bondage, everything that binds vanishes and I am free. This is the most practical of all worship. It has nothing to do with theorizing and speculation, yet it frightens many. They say it is not right. They go on theorizing about old ideals told them by their grandfathers that a god somewhere in heaven had told someone that he was god. Since that time, we have only theories. This is practicality according to them and our ideas are impractical. No doubt, the Vedanta says that each one must have his own path, but the path is not the goal. The worship of a god in heaven and all these things are not bad, but they are only steps towards the truth and not the truth itself. They are good and beautiful and some wonderful ideas are there, but the Vedanta says at every point, My friend, him whom you are worshipping as unknown, I worship as thee. He whom you are worshipping as unknown and are seeking for throughout the universe has been with you all the time. You are living through him and he is the eternal witness of the universe. He whom all the Vedas worship Nay, more, he who is always present in the eternal I, he existing, the whole universe exists. He is the light and life of the universe. If the I were not in you, you would not see the sun. Everything would be a dark mass. He shining, you see the world. One question is generally asked and it is this, that this may lead to a tremendous amount of difficulty. Every one of us will think, I am God and whatever I do or think must be good, for God can do no evil. In the first place, even taking this danger of misinterpretation for granted, can it be proved that on the other side, the same danger does not exist? They have been worshipping a God in heaven separate from them and of whom they are much afraid. They have been born shaking with fear and all their life they will go on shaking. Has the world been made much better by this? Those who have understood and worshipped a personal God 
and those who have understood and worshipped an impersonal God. On which side have been the great workers of the world? Gigantic workers, gigantic moral powers, certainly on the impersonal. How can you expect morality to be developed through fear? It can never be. Where one sees another, where one hears another, that is Maya. When one does not see another, when one does not hear another, when everything has become the Atman, who sees whom, who perceives whom, it is all he and all I at the same time. The soul has become pure. Then and then alone we understand what love is. Love cannot come through fear. Its basis is freedom. When we really begin to love the world, then we understand what is meant by brotherhood or mankind and not before. So, it is not right to say that the impersonal idea will lead to a tremendous amount of evil in the world, as if the other doctrine never lent itself to works of evil, as if it did not lead to sectarianism, deluging the world with blood and causing men to tear each other to pieces. My God is the greatest God. Let us decide it by a free fight. That is the outcome of dualism all over the world. Come out into the broad, open light of day. Come out from the little narrow paths. For how can the infinite soul rest content to live and die in small ruts? Come out into the universe of light. Everything in the universe is yours. Stretch out your arms and embrace it with love. If you ever felt you wanted to do that, you have felt God. You remember that passage in the Sermon of Buddha, how he sent a thought of love towards the south, the north, the east and the west, above and below, until the whole universe was filled with this love, so grand, great and infinite. When you have that feeling, you have true personality. The whole universe is one person. Let go the little things. Give up the small for the infinite. Give up small enjoyments for infinite bliss. It is all yours, for the impersonal includes the personal. So God is personal and impersonal at the same time. And man, the infinite, impersonal man, is manifesting himself as person. We, the infinite, have limited ourselves, as it were, into small parts. The Vedanta says that infinity is our true nature. It will never vanish. It will abide forever. But we are limiting ourselves by our karma, which, like a chain around our necks, has dragged us into this limitation. Break that chain and be free. Trample law under your feet. There is no law in human nature. There is no destiny, no fate. How can there be law in infinity? Freedom is its watchword. Freedom is its nature, its birthright. Be free and then have any number of personalities you like. Then we will play like the actor who comes upon the stage and plays the part of a beggar. Contrast him with the actual beggar walking in the streets. The scene is perhaps the same in both cases. The words are perhaps the same, but yet what difference? The one enjoys his beggary while the other is suffering misery from it. And what makes this difference? The one is free and the other is bound. The actor knows his beggary is not true, but that he has assumed it for play, while the real beggar thinks that it is his too familiar state and that he has to bear it whether he wills it or not. This is the law. So long as we have no knowledge of our real nature, we are beggars, jostled about by every force in nature and made slaves of by everything in nature. We cry all over the world for help, but help never comes to us. We cry to imaginary beings and yet it never comes. But still we hope, help will come. And thus in weeping, wailing and hoping, one life is passed and the same play goes on and on. Be free. Hope for nothing from anyone. I am sure if you look back upon your lives, you will find that you were always vainly trying to get help from others which never came. All the help that has come was from within yourselves. You only had the fruits of what you yourselves worked for, and yet you were strangely hoping all the time for help. A rich man's parlor is always full, 
But if you notice, you do not find the same people there. The visitors are always hoping that they will get something from those wealthy men, but they never do. So are our lives spent in hoping, 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 which never comes to an end. Give up hope, says the Vedanta. Why should you hope? You have, nay, you are everything. What are you hoping for? If a king goes mad and runs about trying to find the king of his country, he will never find him because he is the king himself. He may go through every village and city in his own country, seeking in every house, weeping and wailing, but he will never find him because he is the king himself. It is better that we know we are God and give up this full search after him and knowing that we are God, we become happy and contented. Give up all these mad pursuits and then play your part in the universe as an actor on the stage. The whole vision is changed and instead of an eternal prison, this world has become a playground. Instead of a land of competition, it is a land of bliss where there is perpetual spring, flowers bloom and butterflies flit about. This very world becomes heaven which formerly was hell. To the eyes of the bound, it is a tremendous place of torment, but to the eyes of the free, it is quite otherwise. This one life is the universal life. Heavens and all those places are here. All the gods are here, the prototypes of man. The gods did not create man after their type, but man created gods. And here are the prototypes. Here is Indra, here is Varuna, and all the gods of the universe. We have been projecting our little doubles and we are the originals of these gods. We are the real, the only gods to be worshipped. This is the view of the Vedanta and this its practicality. When we have become free, we need not go mad and throw up society and rush off to die in the forest or the cave. We shall remain where we were, only we shall understand the whole thing. The same phenomena will remain but with a new meaning. We do not know the world yet. It is only through freedom that we see what it is and understand its nature. We shall see then that this so-called law of fate or destiny occupied only an infinitesimal part of our nature. It was only one side. But on the other side, there was freedom all the time. We did not know this and that is why we have been trying to save ourselves from evil by hiding our faces in the ground like the hunted hare. Through delusion, we have been trying to forget our nature and yet we could not. It was always calling upon us and all our search after God or gods or external freedom was a search after our real nature. We mistook the voice. We thought it was from the fire or from a god or the sun or moon or stars. But at last, we have found that it was from within ourselves. Within ourselves is this eternal voice speaking of eternal freedom. Its music is eternally going on. Part of this music of the soul has become the earth, the law, this universe, but it was always ours and always will be. In one word, the ideal of Vedanta is to know man as he really is. And this is its message, that if you cannot worship your brother man, the manifested God, how can you worship a God who is unmanifested? Do you not remember what the Bible says? If you cannot love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? If you cannot see God in the human face, how can you see him in the clouds or in images made of dull dead matter or in mere fictitious stories of our brain? I shall call you religious from the day you begin to see God in men and women and then you will understand what is meant by turning the left cheek to the man who strikes you on the right. When you see man as God, everything, even the tiger, will be welcome. Whatever comes to you is but the Lord, the Eternal, the Blessed One, appearing to us in various forms, as our father and mother and friend and child. They are our own soul playing with us. As our human relationships can thus be made divine, so our relationship with God may take any of these forms and we can look upon Him as our father or mother or friend or beloved. Calling God mother is a higher ideal 
than calling him father and to call him friend is still higher but the highest is to regard him as the beloved the highest point of all is to see no difference between lover and beloved you may remember perhaps the old persian story of how a lover came and knocked at the door of the beloved and was asked who are you he answered it is i and there was no response a second time he came and exclaimed i am here but the door was not opened the third time he came and the voice asked from inside who is there he replied i am thyself my beloved and the door opened so is the relation between god and ourselves he is in everything he is everything every man and woman is the palpable blissful living god who says god is unknown who says he is to be searched after we have found god eternally we have been living in him eternally everywhere he is eternally known eternally worshiped then comes another idea that other forms of worship are not errors this is one of the great points to be remembered that those who worship god through ceremonials and forms however crude we may think them to be are not in error it is the journey from truth to truth from lower truth to higher truth darkness is less light evil is less good impurity is less purity it must always be borne in mind that we should see others with eyes of love with sympathy knowing that they are going along the same path that we have trodden if you are free you must know that all will be so sooner or later and if you are free how can you see the impermanent if you are really pure how do you see the impure for what is within is without we cannot see impurity without having it inside ourselves this is one of the practical sides of vedanta and i hope that we shall all try to carry it into our lives our whole life here is to carry this into practice but the one great point we gain is that we shall work with satisfaction and contentment instead of with discontent and dissatisfaction for we know that truth is within us we have it as our birthright and we have only to manifest it and make it tangible